So there's a term that's uh, been used in the past. The term was called the end of history. And every time there's a new social political fad, that term is tossed around. And whether that be communism at one point or democracies at another time, it was always this is the one, this is the, this is the system that's going to end all systems. And at the same time, we are approaching the end of history. We're approaching the end of an appointed time that God has allotted for man to rule himself. Like no other creature on the planet, we're able to literally reach up into the heavens. We have traveled literally into the heavens, into space. We can view an image across life, across the planet, over the internet. We have the power to imagine, to plan, to create, because we were made in the image of God that does the same. However, we don't have the belief in that creator. We don't credit the creator. We deny the reality of the creator, and we, believing that we are animals, end up acting like animals not in the image of a creator God, of a creator God with a plan for us. You don't have to be a prophet to see that imminent mass destruction is predictable and it's around the corner. You know, all we have to do is turn on the news, we know what's happening. Countries are falling left and right, they're falling like dominoes. They're falling to murderers. They're falling for people who are lawless, who are evil. And we have nations who are rich, who claim, who think they are rich, but really are trillions and billions of dollars in debt. And they build up a weapons pile to pretty much defend an unsustainable lifestyle. We can't sustain this lifestyle anymore. A lifestyle that's morally deficient, corrupt, self-indulgent, and then there are people who complain about that, but their solution is armed rebellion, revolution, jihad. So people want a day of reckoning, they want a day of justice, they want to bring an apocalypse, but they want to bring it on their own terms. So it's obvious to eyes, with, with those with the eyes to see that there's a clash of civilizations that's coming. And the extremists want to instigate fiery war, and there's and there's going to be a counter push to that. And it's going to bring rise to other extremism. And nation will rise against nation. Ethnicity against ethnicity. Man against man. And nukes will rain radioactive fire. That's pretty gloomy. But that fiery end that man is going to bring down upon himself. God says if he doesn't, Jesus Christ said this in Matthew 24, if he doesn't intervene... No flesh will be saved. So, Satan laughs and directs this fiery destruction, and he thinks he's thwarting God's plan, and God's will. And ironically, it's these religious people who believe in religion who are accelerating this false race for human souls. Because in their view of religion, God is in some kind of race for souls. Okay, so we have to believe in Allah, or believe in Christ, or die. We haven't seen the believe in Christ yet, but we will, because one extremism will give rise to another, and everybody, in the name of a supposed loving father, what a disgusting irony, will bring this world close to destruction. We're living at a very, that very end of the appointed time where God said, okay, you wanted to pull from that tree, want to taste that fruit? Go live there. See what that's like. And as a loving father, he hasn't abandoned us there. We'll, we'll talk about that. He hasn't abandoned us here. Okay? But his plan is to bring us back. Bring us back to him. To reconcile all of us to him. Um, and he has a different fiery end in mind. This, this sermon is about fire. It's about understanding fire. 
It's about how will you be consumed by fire? Okay? God has a different fiery end in mind. It's a awe-inspiring fire. It's a merciful fire. It's a loving fire at his appointed time. Now, the Holy Spirit will literally transform this physical realm and God's fire will create a new heavens and a new earth where only the goodness of God can live safely in it. Any oppositional spirit will perish. Along with it, Satan's work will perish. Death itself will melt into oblivion. The purifying process will consume all unholy things it touches, and only the purest will survive. That's the real fire to be fearful of and to be in awe about. We're not worried about the fire that man can bring. We have to be worried about whether or not we'll survive that fire. Now, in 2 Peter 3, in verse 5, it says, For they deliberately suppressed this fact, but that by the word of God, heavens existed long ago, and an earth was formed out of water and by means of water. Through these things, the world existing at that time was destroyed when it was deluged with water. But by the same word, the present heavens and earth have been reserved for fire by being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Now, Peter uses the word willingly, deliberately, even like a, wish, like a wishful thinking type. Now, we know that science deliberately suppresses facts. We, everywhere we see, we see evidence of a massive judgment on the earth. We see fossils everywhere. We see things carved by water, a massive deluge. And they can present the evidence in a way that removes God from it. But we don't do that. But they deliberately do. They deliberately suppress their own criteria for observable and repeatable phenomena when they say something just arose out of nothing. Can you repeat that? Can you observe that? Yet they suspend that. Um, they deny reality. And Peter said they deliberately suppress this fact. But it's not just the scientists or the atheists who claim, who suppress things. Worse than that is the majority who claim to believe in God. Because the religious suppress, okay, the fact that God brought judgment. He brought judgment by water. And so when things start to fall apart in the world, we have to be careful that bloodlust and revenge doesn't suppress the word of God and his commandments. We have to know and act on the facts <clears throat> that we know of, that we have had our eyes opened to see. The righteous fire of God is coming in his full glory. Let's continue in 2 Peter 3, verse 8. Now, dear friends, do not let this one thing escape your notice, that a single day is like a thousand years with the Lord, and a thousand years are like a single day. The Lord is not slow concerning his promise, as some regard slowness, but is being patient toward you because he does not wish for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. God doesn't want anybody to perish, but for all to come to repentance. That's the big, that's the number one plan. We was, we're out in the world. He wants us all to be reconciled to him. He's not slow. Thousands of years have passed by because he's got a timetable. We have to live out here in this world. We have to understand what it's like. It's what we choose every day. We pluck from that tree every day. That tree of knowledge of good and evil for ourselves. Because it tastes good at the moment. I'm good. I'm good. <clears throat> we have a special understanding of God's plan and we know he's not slow. We have a special understanding of his holy days. And he knows that he's patient with us individually and with the world. Okay. For the past 6,000 years, we have been eating from that tree, but we know that his kingdom will come and will come soon. We know what's coming. It's the end of man and his dis and satanic destructive rule on the earth. And we know that it will begin the Lord's day. And that day <clears throat> will not come like a thief in the night for us. Okay? That day will come, and it will be followed by yet another day. It will, it will commence the kingdom of God on earth. 
and another day will follow that, where the heavens and earth itself will be paved over in the fire of the Holy Spirit to make way for the Father himself to descend and live among his children. In 2 Peter verse 3, uh, 2 Peter 3 verse 10 it says, But the day of the Lord will come like a, like a thief when it comes, the heavens will disappear with a horrific noise, and the celestial bodies will melt away in a blaze, and the earth and every deed done on it will be laid bare. Since all these things are to melt away in this manner, what sort of people must we be? conducting our lives in holiness and godliness while waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God. Because of this day, the heavens will be burned up and dissolved and the celestial bodies will melt away in a blaze. But according to his promise, we're waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness truly resides. Fire will make way, will make ready the age of God. This is a blip in the radar. But even in this little blip, man by himself will cause that blip to poof, to disappear, if left to himself. But God's fire will purify and will bring his kingdom. And that fire is what we'd have better be able to withstand. And again, not fear man's fire or the, f the fire around us, even when times are tough, to fear that ultimate fire that we have to survive in order to live in that kingdom. We must be able we must be able to survive that transition from the physical realm into a spiritual reality. That fire that melts death itself and that transition is the second death. If we want to live forever, we want to, must not suffer that second death. In Revelation 20 verse 14. Let's turn there. Revelation 20 verse 14. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Now notice immediately after the lake of fire, we read about the new heavens and new earth. Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. Remember what Peter said, that the heavens will be burnt up, dissolved, and the celestial bodies melt away in a blaze. <clears throat> uh, um, because we're awaiting new heavens and a new earth where righteousness truly resides so let's continue reading in, in Revelation 21 and I saw verse 2 and I saw the holy city New Jerusalem coming down out of the heaven from God prepared as a bride adorned for her husband and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying behold the tabernacle of God is with man he will dwell with them and he will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall they be mourning or crying nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. We're graced with these words. A lot of people don't even know this. This has been in the Bible for 2,000 years. A lot of people don't understand this. God is coming down. God himself is coming down. But in order to make this his home, it's got to be clean. There's not going to be a drop of impurity. It's got to be all fired away. Okay? All the impurities. And you have to be, the way you survive that, the way you survive that is to have an impure spirit. It's the only way you could do that is to have the spirit of Jesus Christ. That's the only way to survive that. But we're graced with these words because we can begin imagining. There's a majesty and a magnitude of our future. We're preparing for union with holiness. So I think that we really, we talked about meditation and Bible study. We really should understand, really understand the glory of being one with the Father and with the Son. The united body of Christ, the united bride that we are, the united church, it belongs to God. And that unity is just a taste. It's supposed to be a taste of what it will be like. <clears throat> After having successfully passed through the same fire that destroys Satan, destroys his work, destroys death, we're there with God in the end. We're there with God in the end. Because we have to be composed of that spiritual fire with Jesus Christ in us. We have to be the image of Jesus Christ. 
We tried and tested in fire now to come out pure like gold, reflecting God's light, the light of life. Remember when Moses went up to the mountain in the presence of God? He reflected that glow. He came down. He was still glowing. And people looked at him, and they were, they, they were awe-inspired. They, they were inspired, and they were terrified at the same time to see if people come down. He's glowing. What's going on with that? Um, but that's that holiness. That's that holiness. And you know what? That When he went up to that mountain, the mountain in the Bible is, is likened to the, a kingdom. So he went up to the kingdom. It was like a, like a foreshadowing. And remember, if you touch the base of that kingdom, people were fearful because you would die. Even to any animal, anything touching that base of that kingdom, die. Because you have to be 100% pure unless you're with God. God allows you with his spirit to come up to that mountain. <clears throat> and Moses was obedient to God. He had God's spirit. God allowed him to ascend <clears throat> because there was a mission. But even before getting to that mountain, those Israelites were rescued from captivity. And who were they rescued uh, from captivity from? By. They were rescued from captivity by Jesus Christ. It was Christ in the cloud that shaded them, right? By day. And by night that warmed them, lit the way, struck fear in the enemy. And 1 Corinthians 10, it says, For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea and all ate the same spiritual food, all drank the same spiritual drink for they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not well pleased for they were laid low in the wilderness. A lot of people went through trials. Yes, it was bad in Egypt, but, you know, it was rough going through what they went through to get to the mountain. And so there were complainers, there were people who didn't trust, there were people who couldn't survive that fiery trial. Just like Mr. Morris was talking about, fiery trials that we go through, and the church has gone through. <clears throat> it was Christ with them. Who allowed Moses to ascend and it was Christ with us now that allows us in, in his mercy and his grace to go up to get a taste of that kingdom to go up with him and ultimately who will allow us to enter the kingdom now after the Feast of Tabernacles a lot of, of us come back I, I, I had a sermon after the Feast of Tabernacles we come back with glows on our faces <laughs> we're all refreshed we were with brethren we were in a mini kingdom of God. That's what it represents. We're happy. We're, we're, we're fellowshipping every day. We come back with that same glow that Moses had, really. <clears throat> but we're not in the kingdom yet, and not every day is a Feast of Tabernacles, as we know. So what do we do? We have to wear the protective righteousness of Christ to withstand the fires of our tribes. Our worldly gold, our toys, they perish. Our inheritance cannot fade away. And it won't melt into nothing. <clears throat> We're protected by the Holy Spirit of Christ unto salvation. Our trials prove our faith. We're tested by fire now to withstand the fire later. It says in 1 Peter 1, verse 4, To obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled, and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God. That's that Holy Spirit. That's the fire of God, through faith, for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The world is under satanic influences and we're slaves to demonic impulses. And it won't be long until Christians are in physical bondage again. Right now we're definitely in spiritual bondage. And actually there are people who profess the name of Christ, whether they be in the church or not, who are under physical bondage right now across the world. 
That's just the reality. And if we think it's not coming here, we're fooling ourselves. But let's travel back in time and we go to the United Kingdom of Israel under David and Solomon. And after Solomon, it splits in two and the ten tribes are brought into captivity. <clears throat> 722 BC. They're conquered by the Assyrians. And Judah learns nothing of the sins of the northern tribes. And they go into captivity under the Babylonian Empire. And this is something that we read about last week as well in, the, uh, in one of the Bible studies. King Nebuchadnezzar selects men from Judah to learn the Babylonian ways. And chosen to, to learn the ways of, of the Babylonians, the three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they, in the middle of this captivity, in the middle of these influences around them, strong, I mean, this is life for limb, they refuse to eat defiled food. They refuse to practice certain practices. Okay? And they stand up for God's way in the middle of this. Now, I'm sure because they, they, were, they had the love of God in them that people around them understood them to be loving people, to be good people, and they were able to negotiate. They found a way with the Holy Spirit to be able to live God's way in the middle of this captivity. Okay? But then came Nebuchadnezzar creating a golden statue. Right? So he creates a golden statue and um, he gathers multitudes around this new image, this huge statue, this image from around the world. And he says in Daniel 3 and verse 4, Then the herald made a loud proclamation to you, O peoples, nations, and language groups. The following command is given. When you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, trigon, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music, you must bow down and pay homage to the golden statue that King Nebuchadnezzar has erected. Whoever does not bow down and pay homage will immediately be thrown in the midst of a furnace of blazing fire. Therefore, when you, they all heard the sound of the horn, the flute, zither, trigon, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music, all the peoples, nations, and language groups began bowing down and paying homage to the golden statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had erected. Not much has changed. All right? I could, I could give you this. I mean, go to Wall Street. You got a big bull there with the horns. And then the sound goes off. Ding, 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 ding. At the end of the thing, there's a, you know, whatever. It's not exactly that, but people are worshiping that golden calf, right? Yeah. At the same time, this happened in Dura in Babylon. This is modern-day Iraq, okay? There are people there who literally bow down to a false god at the sound. A sound's going off, a horn's going off bowing down. And guess what they're doing? They're torturing people for not doing the same. Under the threat of torture, they force converts. It's not that much different. This is an ancient history. This is across the globe. The same globe we can see in our pockets with our phones. Okay, This is reality. <clears throat> so people complain to the king about three Jews refusing to bow down to the image. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego threatened with fire. <clears throat> the name happens, the Hebrew names happen to be Hananiah, which means God is gracious, God's grace. Mishael, which means God's power. Azariah, which means God has helped, denoting the mercy, forgiveness, and the spirit. So, <clears throat> grace, power, mercy, forgiveness, and spirit. This is what that lesson is. Okay, they're going to throw the fire at us. This is what God's lesson is for us, to remember these three people, these three words, these three names, and what it denotes. Reading in verse 19. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with wrath, and his facial expression was altered towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He answered by giving orders to heat the furnace seven times more than it was usually heated. He commanded certain valiant warriors who were in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in order to cast them into the furnace of blazing fire. Then these men were tied up in their trousers, their coats, their caps, and their other clothes and were cast into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. 
For this reason, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace had been made extremely hot, the flame of the fire slew those men who carried up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell into the midst of the furnace of the blazing fire, still tied up. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and stood up in haste and said to his high officials, Was it not three men we cast bound into the midst of the fire? They replied to the king, Certainly, O king. He said, Look, I see four men loosed and walk, walking about in the midst of the fire without harm. And the appearance of the fourth is like the Son of God. Four people in the midst of the fire, tied up. And uh, then the, the, when they're seen again, there's a fourth in there. Christ was in that mountain. Christ brings up us to the mountain. And he is Christ in the fire, right? And they're loose. They're, they're not tied up anymore, right? The only thing that melted was that Babylonian bondage. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the furnace of the blazing fire. He responded and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come out, ye servants of the Most High, and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the midst of the fire. <clears throat> the satraps, the perfect prefects, the governors, the king's high officials gathered around and saw in regard to these men that the fire had no effect on the bodies of these men, nor was the hair on their head singed, nor were their trousers damaged, nor had the smell of fire even come upon them. Nebuchadnezzar responded and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who put their trust in him. Violating the king's command and yielding up their bodies so as not to serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore I make a decree that any people, nation, or tongue that speaks anything offensive against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb, and their houses reduced to rubbish heap, inasmuch as there is no other god who is able to deliver in this way. Then the king caused Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to prosper in the province of Babylon. Okay, so if God flipped that situation, right? He made a convert. He made a convert out of Nebuchadnezzar, really. Nebuchadnezzar declaring God after seeing the power of God. No other God able to deliver like that. Okay? Not even their clothes. Now, we can say that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego risked exalted positions in the king's court. They risked life and limb. But they didn't risk that. They got to that exalted position by following God's way. Okay? What they feared was the living fire of the living God. Okay? They feared that more. Okay? They respected that more. They loved that more. And when Nebuchadnezzar wanted to heat that seven times hotter, okay? God delivers sevenfold much better. There's a beautiful verse in Psalm 91. I apologize for being as sentimental as I am. It's my personality. Um, if Psalm 91, verse 14. It says, remember when Nebuchadnezzar was lighting us up seven times hotter and his own, his own people died. Verse 14, it says, because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. That's number one. I will protect him, number two, because he knows my name. If you know God is the Almighty, then you know God is the Almighty. Okay, look at these names around here. These, these are the names of God right here. Do you know his name? Do you really know his name? He will protect you. When he calls to me, I will answer him. That's number three. I will be with him in trouble. Christ was there, right? Christ was there with them. He's there with us. These are, those were lessons for us as well. Through time, I will rescue him and honor him. Four, 
Or did I skip one? I will be with him. I will rescue him, which is the same as deliver. I will honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him. Long life. What's the longest of the longs? It's eternal. It says long life here. You, we know that his plan is eternal life for us. And show him my salvation. Again, Christ was there. Christ is with us. We're baptized in water and continually purified by fire. We're baptized in more, in more <clears throat> and emerge a new creation, and our sins are passed over. Jerusalem on Pentecost, we know that there were tongues of fire that came over people. They were there because they knew God's appointed time. They knew to be there, gathered together, because they understood God's plan. Okay? Not fully. They don't fully know everything. But they know enough to celebrate that holy day. Okay? Even after Christ's resurrection. Not done away with. They're there and tongues of flame over folks. Reading in Hebrews 5, verse 8. In Hebrews 5, verse 8. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Being designated by God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So, the reason I read that in this context is that, yes, we're baptized. Our sins are forgiven. Our past sins are forgiven. But in Hebrews 5 here, it's saying that Christ, and it's a beautiful line here. It's very deep, this line right here. Because it's saying that he was a son of God. He learned obedience. He suffered. When God said, you're expelled. From this, it was a temporary expulsion, and we're out there on our own to a degree, to a degree only because God, those who you, if we call on Him, He answers. And He's, we read that in Psalm 91. He's there for the people who understand where they are, that they're not in the kingdom yet. A lot of people like to say, "Oh, the kingdom is the kingdom is inside you. The kingdom is here and there. The kingdom is not here. We're not in the kingdom." Okay, we have a taste of the kingdom if you have the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. But the world is far from the kingdom. Yep. And the beautiful piece about this line is that not only did he doesn't, you know, it hurts a father to have their children out there learning like that. But the fire, <clears throat> the father hurts with us. He suffers with us. He suffered right here. He suffered to the point of death, okay? And he did not sin. In the, and as a result, he becomes our high priest. Mm -hmm. So it's not just our past sins that are washed away. But that high priest, he brought blood back and he, and he put that blood over the Ten Commandments. He put that over the mercy seat, okay? As a sign of forgiveness. Uh, that blood... That Jesus Christ shed for us, that sinless blood, okay, is brought back to the temple in heaven, okay? Brought back to the presence of God, okay, to have mercy on us, to have his spirit on us so we have mercy so we survive that ultimate fire at the end because his plan for us is salvation and reconciliation back to him, okay? So he's a priest who continually battles for us. Okay. That fire that is the Holy Spirit continues to melt away the old you from the inside out. In 1 Peter 4, verse 12, it says, Dear friends, do not be astonished that a trial by fire is occurring among you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in the degree that you have shared in the sufferings of Christ, so that when his glory is revealed, you may also rejoice and be glad. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory, who is the spirit of God, rests on you. Again, in James 1, verse 2, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let the steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, 
with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in his ways. <clears throat> in these two verses, we're asked that literally be joyful that you're going through what you're going through. Okay, because you haven't, and if you lack <clears throat> wisdom, ask God. Okay, what he is saying here to a degree is that you know what's happening. You know that you're out in this world. You know that you will go through trials, but you know, also know the end results. And he's given us example through history, and he's given us his written word, and he's given us his living word inside of us to overcome that. Right? And he's, I mean, it's tough, but he says, if you lack that understanding, that deep understanding, pray for it. Pray for it. And Daniel 12, verse 10, it says, Many will be purified, made spotless, and refined, but the wicked will continue to be wicked. None of the wicked will understand, but those who are wise will understand. Okay? And it brings up wicked, it brings up understanding, it brings up the purification. Yes, you're going through a trial, okay? But you have to hold on. Hold on to what, by the way? What am I talking about here? You have to, the way you keep that Holy Spirit is by keeping His commandments. By keeping, by being obedient. This is about not plucking from that tree. This is about not living a sinful life. This is about resisting no matter the trials of your fire. Okay, this is about resisting temptation when the rest of the world wants to choke themselves and kill themselves and blow themselves up and in the news we see about the police or, 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 or this white group or this black group and wants to get us involved at each other's throats. We have to bring ourselves to Jesus Christ and we have to bring people around us to Jesus Christ. Okay? And we have to not participate in sinful behavior that way. We have to not let that melt. <clears throat> um, we have to be melted by the Spirit of God and not let that melt that strong character that we go. In Daniel 11, verse 35, some of the wise will stumble. So even if you know this, you're going to stumble. Some of the wise will stumble so that may, they may be refined, purified, and made spotless until the time of the end, for it will still come at the appointed time. A lot of people know, know these things. Okay? And they'll stumble, and maybe they'll fall away. Maybe they'll survive. Again, we were talked about, we talked about the church. Now, I was part of that group that when the church split up, okay, I was part of those, you know, uh, I'm not making excuses for myself. The church split, and I split. Mm -hmm. And just a quick personal story, I, you know, I, I lived a life out in the world. Not that I was, you know, gone crazy in the world, but I was just not part of the church. Mm -hmm. And, um... I lost, I lost my mother, and, and right before I came to the church, I lost my mother, I lost my sister to cancer, and my house was battered by Sandy, right? And in the middle of that, people were like feeling sorry for me, and I wasn't feeling sorry for myself, I actually felt blessed, and I felt blessed, and so I thank God for that feeling, that in the midst of that, I still felt blessed. And so I came, <clears throat> came back, eventually came back after that. Um, but that's what we have to pray for. I'm not saying I earned that feeling, but we, we have to pray for that feeling. We have to pray for that endurance and that peace through the trials. <clears throat> so when we have that glow and when we catch fire, and maybe I call fire again, right? <laughs> rekindled that flame, that Holy Spirit. And maybe you can, as a fire, light somebody else up. Right? Light somebody else up. My wife is here in the front row. She wasn't part of the church. Knew nothing about the church. Right? Loves God. Loves the church. Loves His Word. Right? People around us, when people see the difference, and we can have people catch fire around us. In 
some people will be afraid when, you know, when Moses came back down, right? People were afraid of that globe. Well, what is that? Who, is, who are you now? Like, what, what's your story? Um, so there's a fire that can consume our obstacles, but it can also consume our friendships, right? The old friendships, the worldly stuff. It says in Luke 12, verse 449, I have come to bring fire on the earth. Luke 12, verse 49, I have come to bring fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. I have a baptism to undergo, and how distressed I am until it is finished. Do you think I have come to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. Sometimes, yes, that flame, that flame separates. But it separates maybe for, for a reason. God has his reasons, right? People, um... There's another type of flame that we hold or we're capable of holding, even when we have part of the flame of the Holy Spirit, even without it being in abundance. And that flame is our tongue, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. yeah. That flame is our tongue. And James 3, verse 5, James 3, verse 5 says, So too the tongue is a small part of the body, yet has great pre pretenses. Think how small a flame sets a huge forest ablaze, and the tongue is a fire. The tongue represents the world of wrongdoing among the parts of the bodies. It pollutes the entire body and sets fire to the course of human existence and is set on fire by hell. You know, that those tongues of fire, I'm sure, help split the church apart and splits friendships apart. And... I just want to read something in 1 Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians 3, verse 3. It says, For you are still influenced by the flesh, for there is still jealousy and dissension among you. Are you not influenced by the flesh and behaving like unregenerated people? For whenever someone says, I am with Paul, or I am with Apollos, are you not merely human? What is Apollo really, or what is Paul? Servants through whom you came to believe, and each of us in the ministry the Lord gave us. I planted Apollo water. But God caused it to grow. So neither the one who plants counts for anything, nor the one who waters, but God who causes the growth. The one who plants and the one who waters work as one, but each one will receive his reward according to his work. We're co-workers belonging to God. You're God's field, God's building. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation, but someone else builds on it. And each one must be careful how he builds, for what, no one can lay any foundation other than what is being laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each builder's work will be plainly seen. For the day will make it clear, because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test what kind of work each has done. If what someone has built survives, he will receive a reward. If someone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will, will be saved, but only as through fire. So we have the church of God here, the church of God there, the church of God everywhere. Um, you and I, we're the church of God. We're the temple of God. I'm not saying that Anything other than what it says in the next verse here, in verse 16. Do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? The United Church of God is exactly that, a united church. Our doors are open. You can walk in. You don't have to pass a test. You don't have to do anything but come in through the door and share the unity that we feel with our Savior. Okay? That's who we are. <clears throat> We cannot get involved with the bitter talk and this church and that church or the other church. This is a church. You and I are the church. We, you and I are what make this through God's Holy Spirit work. In 2 Chronicles 7, speaking of the temple of God, Solomon dedicated that temple Fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offerings and sacrifices, and the glory of God filled the temple. And 
He did that in front of all the children of Israel to see how the fire came down and the glory of God on the temple. And they bowed their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshiped and praised God saying, for he, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. We're God's temple now. And that fire that he gives to us and his Holy Spirit, we need to be just as thankful. For he is good and his mercy does endure forever. It's, it was dramatic and visible for those people to see that dedication of the temple, that fire come down. It's dramatic and visible to see, and visible for other people to see when you change your life, and when you sin no more, and when you walk the walk. The fire was kept alive until they were went into captivity, and we talked about that with Nebuchadnezzar, and. After that, there was a second temple. And the second temple, um, for folks who don't know, know of it, I, I highly recommend a sermon that is online by the United Church of God. Um, and it's about the abomination of desolation. It tells the story of the second temple, okay? And how the second temple what happened was that uh, there was a uh, Assyrian monarch, Antiochus Epiphanes, who outlawed the Jewish religion and ordered Jews to worship Greek, Greek gods. And in 168 BC, he massacred thousands and desecrated the Holy Temple and put up an altar of Zeus and sacrificed pigs in the temple. He did this on the winter solstice. The winter solstice, December 25th. I mean, I think that it's very significant that on December 25th, Christmas, the desecration of the temple occurred. Okay, desecration. The sacrifice in a pig, right? Worshiping on the solstice. As Christians claim to do today in the name of God. But it was an abomination. Even Jesus Christ called it, as spoken of by Daniel. Or one that's coming. This was a forerunner of what's to come. But there was a, uh, the son of a priest, Judah Maccabee, who wins back the temple area and rededicates the temple. And so there's a miracle that the Jews claim, which I have no reason to doubt. It was a miracle that they only had one day of undefiled oil to rededicate that temple on that same day, on that 25th. Right? But that light lasted eight days. Right? The light lasted eight days. Now, to tie into that, and I'm going to get back to that in a second, I want to read something. John 10, and verse 22. John 10, verse 22. <clears throat> At the time, the Feast of Dedication, that is the holiday, it's not a holy day, it's the holiday that the Jews created to commemorate this victory over the abomination. At the time, the Feast of Dedication, also known as the Feast of Lights, took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. The Jews then gathered around him saying, and were saying to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly, and I and the Father, <clears throat> tell us plainly. And then in verse 30, he tells them plainly. I and the Father are one. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. And in verse 34, Jesus answered to them, Has it not been written in your law, I said you are gods? If he, if he called them gods to whom the word of God came and the scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? When they rededicated that temple, Okay. In the Maccabean days, that light lasted as long as it did. And God is saying here, this is the same God, this is the same Jesus Christ who rededicates our temple, ourselves, our, our bodies. We sacrifice them. This is our temple 
when he rededicates. When we rededicate and we rededicate to Jesus Christ. And he tells them plainly, I am the Son of God here. On that light, on that day of lights, on that feast of dedication and on that festival of lights. This isn't an electronic light. <laughs> this is this is this is a flame. This is the flame. Flame on. Holy Spirit on. We dedication of our temples here going on. Okay? No coincidence that it mentions that it was on the Feast of Dedication. Another interesting bit, which may be a possibility, okay, is that we know Christ wasn't born on Christmas, right? He was born right around the Feast of Tabernacles. If he was born around the Feast of Tabernacles, it's not unlikely, not improbable, that he could have been conceived during the Feast of Dedication. The light unto the world that came unto this world, the Holy Spirit approaching. Not un, not far-fetched to believe that that, was, that didn't happen at that time. Okay, it's a beautiful story that's being written in the pages of history. And he's opening our eyes to see these things. And we already know his holy days. I'm not saying this is a holy day. I'm saying this is life. This is life for plain, plain as day for us to see out there. Malachi 3, verse 1. Behold, I am going to send my messenger, and he will, be, he will clear the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, said the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? Who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire, like full of soap finest fire, his messenger. Psalm 66, verse 10, for you, God, tested us, you refined us like silver. Just checking on the time here. Okay, we have a good time. You know, because, it's, because we know as much as we do, because we know his holy days, his plan, we know beautiful things, we know we know deep spiritual things, and we know we learn every day. Every day. There's not something I don't learn when I write, open the Bible again. It's not something new. There's never anything um, that surprises me anymore of what I pick up through the Holy Spirit. But do we think, because we know God's truth, that we're deserving of anything? God allows us to see. He allows us to see these things. He's tapped us on the shoulder and he says open your eyes I'm letting you see I'm letting you see in this world but when we're allowed to see in this dark world through his light we have to act we have to obey and we must endure we have to take action we have to keep his commandments to the spiritually lukewarm church of Laodicea in Revelation 3 verse 17 he says because you say I am rich and have acquired great wealth and need nothing, but do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked, take my advice and buy gold from me, refined by fire, so you can become rich. Buy from me white clothing so you can be clothed and your shameful nakedness will not be exposed. And buy eye salve to put on your eyes so you can see all those I love, I rebuke, and discipline. So be earnest and repent. So he says, buy that gold from me. Because like we said, he was sent to suffer for us, suffer with us. Okay? We were sent out into the world, but he was sent here as well. And he suffered up to the point of death. Right? So he's been through that fire. And he's got that gold. His faith was the number one faith. Never sinned. Remain faithful throughout. His gold is the most precious gold. He says, buy that faith from me. It's not our faith. We're not going to do it. Buy that gold from me. Okay? His, he's has his refined. He's passed through that fire, but we are passing through the fire as well. And we buy the faith of Jesus Christ from him. We ask him for that faith. Okay? We remain in that faith. 
And remember that Peter said our trials show the proven character of your faith. And that was more precious than gold. Tested by fire. Matthew 19, verse 16. Behold, a man came up to him saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments, he said to him. Which ones? And Jesus said, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, honor your father and mother, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, All these I have kept, what do I still lack? And Jesus said to him, If you will be perfect, go sell what you possess, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. I'm just pausing there for a second. The person thinks he knows. He knows the Ten Commandments. Oh, I, 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 yeah, I do that. Yeah, right. He, he, he does that. Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go sell your possessors, give to the poor, you will have treasure in heaven. Come follow me. And when the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus said to his disciples, truly I say to you, only with difficulty will the rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, who then can be saved? But Jesus looked up and said, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. So the point was that this man thought he knew the commandments, but was he coveting his riches? He was coveting, right? He thought he knew, but he was covered. He was coveting. He didn't want to sacrifice to that degree that Christ says is required for the kingdom of God. And God says, easier for a, for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle. Does that mean you you can be rich? You you can't be rich and enter the kingdom of God. It depends what you put first, because it says here, with man it's impossible. With God, all things are possible. With God, all things are possible. See, people in the time, they, they, they knew God as being one who provided the material wealth there in front of your face. That was, a, that, was a, that was an indicator that you were blessed by God. And it is to a degree. But God has greater plans for us. God has eternal plans for us. He has eternal life planned for us. And those riches can't compare to what we might get here. Right? Our eyes, our faith is not enough. We need the faith of Jesus Christ to overcome. In this day and age, we need to get right with God. And we know, we know we're on the last days. We know we're on the brink. In James 5, verse 3, it says, Your gold and silver, James 5, verse 3, Your gold and silver have rusted, and their rust will be a witness against you. It will consume your flesh like fire. It is in the last days that you have hoarded treasure. Like James can't believe it. Are you kidding me? In the last days, this is when you're wanting this, this close, knowing the truth of God, knowing how close you are to that kingdom come. Now is when you're going to want those worldly possessions. We're keeping a hold of our worldly possessions right now, materially in this world, by, the, by a threat. By a threat. By trillions of dollars in debt that's going to collapse soon. Yeah. Okay. It's going to come. And when it comes, it comes swiftly. Judgment comes swiftly. Sodom and Gomorrah. Swiftly. Swiftly. But for us, it's not going to come like a thief, right? Because we know it's coming. But we have to prepare ourselves. Matthew 16, verse 24. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? But what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father. And then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the, they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, what did, it, what did it mean? Because Jesus was talking to people there 2,000 years ago, and he says, 
Some of you standing here won't test, taste death till you see the Son of Man coming in his glory. So what did, what did he mean? Well, let's keep reading in Matthew 17, verse 1. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and his brother and led them up a high mountain by themselves. Remember that mountain is like a kingdom of God, right? And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah, talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good that we're here. If you wish, I'll make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. He was still speaking. When behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them and said, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. Then the disciples heard this. They fell on their faces and were terrified. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and have no fear. And when they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. And as they were coming down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, Tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. So what do we notice here? Right? Notice that it's after six days they're taken up to a mountain. After six days of man's rule, right? After six days, the kingdom of God, right? Luke says about eight days. Whether it, Well, whether it's the seventh day or the eighth day, we know that that's the kingdom of God, right? The kingdom of God on earth and then the Father coming down, right? Eighth day. He's take, they're taken up to the high mountain, like the kingdom of God. His face shone. His clothes like light, transfigured, in a glorified state. That resurrection picturing what is our future, what he has planned. He was the first of many brethren. Okay? That vision of the kingdom of God. Mo Moses and Elijah. Why Moses and Elijah? The law and the prophets. They were representing the law and the prophets there with him. Confirming that's the word of God. That, those were the, that was the word of God. And this is the living word of God. And that final stamp, the word of the voice from heaven, God the Father. This is my son, whom I well please. Confirmation. And these fall on their faces. They hear the word of God, right? And yes, fearful. Remember that in, in the past, you couldn't touch that, that, that mountain. And Jesus says, have no fear. Have no fear. God, yes, it can be fearful. His, his fire is fearful. It's terrifying, right? Awe-inspiring at the same time. But it's ultimately love, right? Ultimately love. Have no fear. There will be no fear. There will be no death. Wipe away every tear is God's intention. God is a God of love, not a God of fear. When we say fear, really, it's mostly respectful awe, like People use awesome, the word awesome all the time. It's annoying because it takes away the value of that word. It's awesome. It's awe-inspiring. Okay? And we contrast that vision of the kingdom, okay, and that glorified state and that glow and that light with the parable of the rich man and the beggar in Luke 16, right? Where instead of a transfiguration, there's a condemnation by fire. A condemnation of the rich, or the so-called rich, the ones who think they're rich, the ones who think they know. And Abraham tells them, Luke 16, verse 29, he says, They have Moses and the prophets because the person is begging for a family, uh, mercy on his family. Knowing the vision of this fire that consumes, right, making way for the way of God, and he didn't prepare himself. They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said to him, if they don't hear Moses and the prophets, neither will be, they be convinced if somebody should rise from the dead. You don't do the word of God, you don't listen, you don't read, you don't understand the word of God, you don't take that time, then you don't understand Jesus Christ. Because they're one and the same. He's the living word of God. Christ was there with the law and the prophets. Christ was there in the past. We saw several examples. He's here with us now, and he will be with us in the future. All across time. Because he is the word made flesh, 
and the word made spirit as well. The spirit and the power that you will be one with. Matthew 17. After the transfiguration, it, it makes an allusion to Elijah again as one of the witnesses. Matthew 17, verse 10. And the disciples asked him, Then why do the scribes say that first Elijah must come? He answered, Elijah does come and will restore all things, but I tell you that Elijah has already come. And they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they pleased. And so also the Son of Man will certainly suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was speaking to them of John the Baptist. I mentioned that because they were, to, they, they were, they understood that Elijah had to come, and people now waiting for Jesus Christ's return understand about the two witnesses, right? We hear about the two witnesses. Revelation eleven it says, "I will grant my two witnesses authority to prophesy for one thousand two hundred and sixty days, dressed in sackcloth." These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. If anyone wants to harm them, fire comes out of their mouths and completely consumes their enemy. <clears throat> the, the two witnesses are able to call fire down from heaven. They're literally bringing fire down from heaven. It, at least that's what it appears to be these last days but we as witnesses to Jesus Christ in our lives can do the same to a degree we can call upon the Holy Spirit that is in heaven and have it reside in us we can have the Holy Spirit of God live inside us we could call that fire down from heaven and try to be a light and try to be light to people around us illuminate our way have other people try to catch that fire as well. Okay? These prophecies can be about us to a degree as well. And I don't mean the fire from heaven where, you know, some people will take that the wrong way and, you know, justify of, you know, behavior where they think it's an emotional thing. It's about... Love, it's about power, and it's about self-control at the same time. That's what the Holy Spirit says that it's in it, in 2 Timothy, about what the Spirit is about. It's about self-control as well. It's about the self-control enough to be able to keep the commandments in the middle of fiery trials. That's the fire that we want to call down from heaven to us. So I'll just conclude by saying that there will be fire that consumes and the question is, how will you be consumed by that 